You probably think that keeping something warm is easy, that all you've got to do is find the most cost-effective heating element, plug it in, and you're good to go. But you'd be wrong. Really, to see our reptiles and amphibians at their full energetic potential, we have to try and emulate the conditions that they would experience in the wild, and this requires a little bit more of a subtle approach. So, I'm JTB Reptiles teaching you how to follow nature's example, so subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell, and let's get straight into the video. So I can bet that a good few of you clicked on this video and saw all the heating elements behind me and expected me to just jump straight into the pros and cons of each of them, but before we go into that, you really do have to understand what heat actually is. When we talk about heat, what we're actually referring to is the longest wavelength, lowest energy waves of the optical radiation part of the electromagnetic spectrum, as discussed in the first episode of this series. When we take a look at this in a little bit more detail, we can see that heat is alternatively called infrared, and that it can be subdivided into three classes, namely infrared A, infrared B and infrared C, or IRA, IRB and IRC, respectively, which do have the respective wavelengths of 700 to 1400 nanometers, 1400 nanometers to 3000 nanometers, and then finally for IRC, 3000 to a million nanometers. Sunlight, which refers to the electromagnetic radiation that actually makes it through our atmosphere, only contains wavelengths below 4000 nanometers. So basically what this means is that the sunlight that you feel on Earth contains plenty of infrared A, a lot of infrared B, and only a smidgen of infrared C. Where you do find infrared C in nature is coming out of objects, so if on a warm day you go up and put your hand on a rock or something, then it feels slightly warm, well a portion of that is infrared C. Now then, I'm sure if you've ever stepped outside on a warm summer's day, not that they actually exist in the UK, but you know, they might do elsewhere, um, then you can sort of feel that nice sun feeling when the sun's beating down on you and it sort of feels all warm and tingly and nice to most people, um, but if you put your hand underneath a ceramic heat emitter in a reptile enclosure, it doesn't feel the same. And the reason for this is because of the different properties of infrared A, B and C. Now the sun, with all its infrared A and B, can actually penetrate heat energy deep through the skin and into uh, the core of our tissues, or in other words, it can fully energize a reptile. Infrared C, which is what ceramic heat emitters give off, doesn't have this same effect and so it can't energize our reptiles as efficiently, and because it just gets like stopped in the skin, that is why it sort of just feels hot rather than nice and tingly. So only now that you understand this distinction between IRA, B and C, we can actually begin looking at the different heating elements and discussing properly which ones are the best. Let's start off with the worst, shall we? A hobby mainstay, the heat mat, is by far the worst heating element that you could possibly use. These things are just completely crap in that they only give off infrared C, which as I've discussed is only going to go as far as heating your reptile's skin, and it isn't going to provide that core body temperature, that full energy that they need to truly thrive. And so these things, whilst they're going to keep your reptile alive for a good number of years, um, so much so that you think they're doing a good job, what they are not going to do is allow it to truly thrive and truly display all of its natural coloration and activity as you would get if it was a wild animal. Plus, the other obvious rubbish thing about these is that they only really work if they are placed underneath a tank, which means that you can only use them on glass and plastic enclosures, which with plastic enclosures has issues with volatile organic compound release, and then these things, you know, heating from below is not natural. The sun heats from above, not from below, and that is how reptiles have therefore evolved to use it, not from below like these stupid things did. Second worst is the ceramic heat emitter. Now, as I've previously stated, these things do only give off IRC, which ain't doing much for your reptile, it is literally just warming up their skin and nothing else. 
Um, they're a bit better than heat mats because they do, like, you know, send heat downwards, um, which is a lot more natural than coming from above. Um, they do sort of create an ambient heat too, which is something heat mats simply cannot do. But these still are pretty rubbish. And if you want evidence of this, I do have a pretty good anecdote. So I'm sure that you will have seen images of bearded dragons sitting in their basking zones for hours and hours and hours, with the mouths gaping because they're trying to cool down, and people usually tell you that that's a good thing, that they're at a good temperature, but this really isn't the case. Now my beardy char, um, who lives over here and is brew mating at the moment, um, I did actually used to use that same ceramic heat emitter that I just showed you that I've just put on the floor, that's why I'm putting it. Uh, I did used to use that with him, and when I had it, he would sit underneath it for hours and hours with his mouth open. Now, think about this for a second. This is an animal from the Australian outback, where it is very hot, and where water is at an absolute premium. So these animals have evolved to conserve water as best they can. Now, considering that there is a cool end in Char's enclosure, why would he sit in the basking zone with his mouth open, trying to cool down when he could just go to the cool end, considering that leaving his mouth open, that cooling down step works by water evaporating from his mouth, and therefore he is wasting water, which if he were in the wild would be very dangerous for him. You see what I'm getting at? It is not natural and it doesn't make sense. And the reason is that the ceramic heat emitter with its infrared C is warming up the skin of the dragon very effectively, but not its core. So what the dragon thinks is like its skin feels really hot and it wants to cool down, so it opens its mouth quickly to let the heat out. But its core body temperature, which is the critical thing, is still too low. And so it stays sitting in the hot zone, trying to warm up in the inside and cool down on the outside at the same time. And that is why we see this unnatural behaviour of gaping for hours and hours. Now then, the next type of heating element that I'm going to discuss is like coloured bulbs or what are commonly called infrared reptile lamps. Now first off before we discuss the merits of these things, um, I do just want to say that calling them infrared bulbs is a complete marketing gimmick because I, as you should now understand, when we talk about heat we are generally just referring to infrared wavelengths anyway, so any heater that you can buy gives off infrared wavelengths so calling these bulbs infrared is just completely nonsensical. But onto the actual technology of these bulbs, they do give off infrared A and they do give off infrared B. So they are a lot better in that regard than the heat mat or the ceramic heat emitter. But they are sold on the pretense of being suitable for nighttime heating, and this simply isn't the case. They give off far too much in the way of visible light to not disturb your reptile's natural day night cycle or its circadian rhythm, to give it a proper name. Now, on the other side of that, these bulbs are also unsuitable for daytime use because they simply don't give off enough visible light to properly stimulate heliocentric reptiles, which is something I'll talk about later. But in summary of these bulbs, there's basically no point to them. But with that, we can finally start talking about the heaters that are actually some good. The first class of these heaters is the carbon filament lamp, or to give them the brand name at the minute, the Arcadia Deep Heat Projector. Now, these things give off a decent amount of infrared A, and they give off great levels of infrared B, so in terms of effective heating and getting that core body temperature up, these are really fantastic heaters. Now, the other great thing about them is that they do only give off four looks of light, which basically means they are very, very, very dim, even at full power, and so they are entirely suitable for use 24-7 as heaters during the night time. Now you'll notice looking around most of my setups that I do actually have an Arcadia Deep Heat Projector in most of them because these are just absolutely excellent 24-7 heaters, effectively warming up your reptile and getting it to the desired temperature in the core of its body. And as for the best heater of all, you might actually be surprised to hear that it is the Tungsten Filament Lamp. Now these things do come in plenty of shapes and sizes, the most familiar being just the bog standard sort of spherical almost bulbs that you used to use to heat, um, heat, light your houses. 
No matter the specific type of tungsten lamp that you get, they all give off a pretty decent amount of infrared A and a good amount of infrared B. And in this regard, I would actually say that they are the most superior heater because the sort of proportions of infrared A and infrared B that they give off most closely resemble that in sunlight out of any heating element, even the Arcadia DP projector. Plus, because these do have a good level of visible light, they are fantastic daytime heaters, um, so they do beat the Arcadia DP projector in that regard too, but of course they can't be used for nighttime heating. Now for most people, nighttime heating for their reptiles actually isn't necessary, which is something I'll probably talk about in the future, um, but for me it is, which is why you see in most of these setups I do use DP projectors rather than these things because I can't use these at night time and it is essential for me to have a nighttime heat supply given that this reptile room does get pretty cold. Ideally though, what I would recommend is if you do need nighttime heating like me, then if you've got room in your enclosure, so I do this for me bearded dragon and I'm soon going to be doing it for me corn snake, um, it's actually to use a tungsten filament lamp for the daytime heating and a separate DP projector for at night and then also to bump things up in the day and that way you are getting the best of both worlds. Now the unfortunate thing about tungsten filament lamps is that because they are such old technology and because they have been so widely used for so long, there is a very large amount of different shapes and sizes of them that you can get and not all of them are created equally. Now one of the bad types I have got in my hand here, this is just an old household light that like we don't use anymore, it's just sat around in a box, um, and this is actually a spot bulb. Now a spot bulb you do not want to use with reptiles. Now the reason you don't want to use a spot bulb, which is any bulb that's got a beam that subtends an angle of less than 30 degrees, I say that definition because some spot bulbs are called spot bulbs and they actually aren't, but anyway, the problem with them is that they are just going to heat a sort of narrow bit of your reptile and that little bit is going to get up to temperature quicker than the rest of the body and therefore they can end up sitting in the like the heat beam for too long so that that little area of their body ends up getting burnt whilst they wait for the rest of the body to warm up. Now a similar effect is created by some totally unreflected tungsten lamps, some of the really cheap ones. I'll chuck up a picture of what I'm talking about but basically you can have it where the heat comes out in sort of weird little narrow patches and this can have the same net effect of using a spot bulb. The ideal lamps that you want to use are floods, um, like flood lamps that sort of cast the heat and light over an even broad area so that the reptile can go in it and warm up evenly all at once. Now there are two types of these, there are the standard incandescent type which looks sort of like the spot bulb that I showed you but it's not quite as angular and it's going to have that 30 degree or wider angle beam and then there also is the sort of newer type, the PAR38 halogen lamp. That just came out so weird, I always say halogen but then it just came out halogen. But yeah, these halogen things, uh, there are pros and cons to them versus the incandescents. Um, personally, um, I don't really have a preference yet because I haven't had long enough to play about with this halogen that Arcadia Reptile sent to me. Um, but after I've played about with it for a couple of months, I'll discuss the merits of this versus the old incandescent type, which has been around for longer and is cheaper. But there are sort of various pros and cons to each that I do want to find out for myself before I share them with you guys. Now before I do just summarise all of those points, there is one last thing that I'd like to address, and this is the idea of belly heat. Now in the reptile hobby, people are sort of like obsessed with the notion that heat from below is necessary for leopard geckos and ball pythons and corn snakes and things like that. And so they sort of reject heat lamps in favour of heat mats. But if you actually look at it sort of sensibly, you will realise that that notion is completely wrong. Now I've already hammered home the point about like overhead heat lamps that have infrared A and infrared B are more effective heaters than things that give off infrared C, such as heat mats. And this applies to objects as well as living things. So if you place a nice bit of slate or a nice dark coloured rock underneath a heat lamp, you are actually going to be providing this spectacular belly heat to your reptile in a much more efficient manner than if you were to go out and buy a heat mat. 
And this is why I do actually talk quite strongly about using natural decorations in a video that I've done in the past that I'll link in the top right hand corner of the screen right now. So to summarise what I've talked about in this video, basically you need infrared A and you need infrared B to see your reptile or amphibian fully energised. Why? It's because these wavelengths penetrate energy deeper into the skin and actually into the core tissues of the animal, which infrared C cannot do. And this is why I choose to use heating elements that do provide infrared A and infrared B, rather than the more old fashioned ones that only give off infrared C. On this note, heat lamps are rubbish, ceramic heat emitters are rubbish, and also infrared heat lamps or coloured bulbs are also rubbish, but for different reasons. Conversely, Arcadia DP projectors and the other carbon filament lamps, but there aren't really any sold for reptiles apart from that one yet, and the good old incandescent lamp, if you choose the right type, do make for much better heaters. So hopefully now you actually understand what it is that you are trying to do when you heat your reptile. Seriously, most people just think like they have a good grasp of what warmth is. You know, warmth is thing like warmness that stuff but really there is a lot more to it and if you want to get it right which is absolutely essential for ectotherms such as reptiles basically cold-blooded animals then you need to actually understand what's going on but yeah hopefully you did enjoy this video and if you did you will subscribe to my channel and make sure to hit that notification bell so that you can learn how to follow nature's example and in a couple of months or so i will be going into the third episode of this series talking about visible light and how absolutely essential that is for reptiles a lot more so than you might expect so yeah guys that's it for now and i'll see you in the next one bye